Okay, we've been recorded. So uh, here's the, uh, the definition of a period periodic number, uh, some, some number s, uh, probably in binary, at least for the most of this presentation. It's got two parts, uh, part A and part B, uh, where the length of part A and the length of part B are the same, and they are equal to n. Uh, so uh, most examples I'll be using are um, 16 bits, so that means uh, n is 4. Uh, almost all of this work generalizes to uh, all n, uh, so uh, n, n has to be at least 1, so the smallest string that we're dealing with is a, a 2-bit string. So that's what a periodic number is. So uh, th th this, this example here, uh, 0010, zero, zero, one, zero repeated twice, um, that's uh, uh, 34, i.e. 32 plus 2. Uh, so clearly, uh, so A equals B, uh, N is 4, and M is 2. So M is the base, which in this case is, uh, is binary. Now, I've always wanted a, corol a corollary, because my name is Grenville Kroll, so why shouldn't I have a corollary? And uh, the, the first corollary of that, um, statement of periodicity uh, is, is the observation um, that the prime constant is aperiodic, i.e. the prime constant is not periodic. So the prime constant is the um, binary encoding of the um, natural numbers greater than 2, so 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and in green we've encoded them as in binary. Um, so two's prime, so that's a one, three is prime, that's a one, four's composite, that's a zero, five's prime, and so on. And so you can see that uh, A and B are not equal. And this is indeed the case for um, uh, all N to infinity uh, for a very simple reason. Does anyone want to chip in with the reason? Well, it's because two is the only even prime. So as we expand that uh, out, um, we never get a repeat of uh, uh, an even prime, so A and B can never be equal. So it's uh, Hardy and Wright showed that the prime constant was irrational in um, uh, in the 1930s in the Hardy and Wright book, but um, this, is a, a first, uh, this is a first time. This is the first time that piece of work has been repeated in, in modern times. There's also another corollary, which is that the prime encoded non-negative integers uh, are also aperiodic. So here we have the natural numbers again, uh, this time going from, from zero and including the, um, uh, uh, so we've again, en again encoded that in, uh, in binary. And again, uh, A can never equal B as N goes to infinity uh, for the simple reason is that uh, when when five becomes prime for the first time, it's obviously uh, different from uh, from zero, which is, is a non-prime. So a, a again, a and b uh, are, are always different for this very very simple reason. So the uh, the primes um, collectively are aperiodic, and I, sh I showed that in my 2013 paper on uh, bientropy. Um, subsequently, about seven years later, um, I applied my bientropy function to the actual primes themselves and uh, found some extraordinary stuff, um, which it has been a great privilege to work with. And so we have a, quite a, a bald theorem. You know, the primes are aperiodic in every base with two exceptions. So here's the proof. Uh, periodic numbers in any base cannot be prime, uh, save two exceptions, which I'll go through in a moment. So some number k is m to the power of n times a plus b. So if you recall that um, periodic number 0010 repeated, uh, that, that is simply um, 2 to the power of 4 times um, 0010 plus 0010 uh, or in deanery um, 
2 to the power of 4 times 2 plus 2. So since a, a equals b, and we're defining uh, a greater than 1, uh, k is equal to m to the power of n plus 1 times a. So since, since a is greater than 1, um, in all, um, for, for every, uh, every string uh, and in every base, um, periodic numbers can't be prime. And that's such a simple result. It's um, uh, um, school arithmetic. Uh, so yeah, so therefore, therefore K is com composite in, uh, in every base. So the exceptions, uh, one's a very simple one, which is that every part, every prime is in fact a periodic number because for example, 23 is simply one one in base 22. So every part, every part, every prime can be expressed as one one, which is not that interesting, but it's important. And the other exception is that uh, we have these things called the Fermat numbers where A equals B equals one. And so uh, the first Fermat number is, the first Fermat prime is one one, which is three. The second one is zero one zero one, which is five, uh, then 17. And 257 and finally 65,537. So these are the uh, only periodic numbers that are prime and it, it, it was thought that there are only five of them but it's never been proven that there are only five of them. Uh, well, in, in my earlier paper I was able to show that uh, there, there is a uh, an acid, asymptote for the number of uh, Fermat, number, Fermat numbers, uh, for the number of Fermat primes, and the asymptote uh, is around about seven. But the probability that you'll find the other two uh, diminishes to a vanishingly short, small number, as uh, Bockland and Conway showed uh, some years ago. So, yeah, so the, the Fermat primes, the only periodic, periodic numbers, apart from the other, the other exception which I spoke of. Um, so how, how do we detect period, periodicity in a number? Um, well, we're going to work in binary because there are a couple of useful proofs that uh, exist in the literature, um, which we'll refer to shortly. These are very important proofs and uh, um, uh, it's striking that uh, they've never been previously used. So we'll detect period, periodicity using what's known as the binary derivative. Uh, so here's our, here's our number s, which is in this case um, 1001, 1100. And to, to compute the binary derivative, uh, starting from the right, uh, we take the adjacent pair of digits and uh, apply the exclusive all rule. And so if, well, if the two digits are the same, uh, which they are in this case, we record a zero, uh, or if the two digits are different, as they are in this case, we record a one. And so for an eight bit number, its first derivative is seven bits long, then six bits long and so on, until the final derivative uh, D7 is, uh, uh, is one bit long. The string itself is, we, we refer to it as D0. And that's, uh, that, that, that is an important role in one particular case. So, the binary der derivative is how we detect periodicity and it, it is a fact that um, every periodic number uh, becomes all zeros eventually. Uh, perhaps I should have done a slide to illustrate that but uh, here's a um, uh, so here's the full set of derivatives for that, that number earlier and notice this derivative here is all ones and the next derivative is uh, all zeros uh, and there's a there's a proof of that in uh, Nathan, Nathanson's work. Uh, and a, a very important point is that for all, all, all binary strings like, as in for every number the, the number of binary derivatives is finite and it's exactly equal to uh, n squared by, divided by 2. So as um, as the number s goes to infinity, um, the uh, so for, for very large s for, for very large strings, the number of uh, derivatives is 
is simply the number is, is much lower. So, so um, Nathan, Mervyn Nathanson did a proof in 71. Um, it was his first paper post, uh, after his, his, his PhD. And he shows that a, a string is periodic if and only if uh, for some k less than uh, 2n, uh, the string is uh, the derivative is, is all zeros. Uh, so that's how we detect periodic periodicity. This works one way so that it, do, it doesn't work in the other direction. Uh, that is to say, if the uh, some derivative is zero, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily imp imply that the string is periodic. So this, this only works one way. So this, for any binary string S, uh, if some derivative is zero, S may not be prime. If DKS is not equal to zero, S may be prime uh, for, all, uh, for all strings between zero and uh, infinity. So this property applies to um, all numbers. So in, 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 in the um, so in the in the binary derivative is an incredibly important a piece of simple mathematics that tells us uh, something incredibly important about whether or not uh, a number is uh, prime or composite. So in an 8-bit string, there are the last derivative is one bit long, and it has two outcomes. It's either zero or a one. And the other incredibly important result is that of Davis et al. in 95. And they show that uh, the pro probability of it being either zero or one is, is 0 0.5. Um, there's a condition attached to that, um, uh, which because we're dealing with all natural numbers, uh, that condition apply, uh, apl applies. Uh, so, um, if we look at the remaining uh, derivatives, um, we get information about the possibility of the string being periodic. So, if we if we look at the seventh derivative, uh, it tells us if the seventh derivative is zero, uh, the number may not be prime. But if the number, if the seventh derivative is one, the number may be prime and it's, it's conditional. And so seven derivatives away, we've got the zeroth derivative, which is the string itself. So clearly if a string is, is eight bit long and it's all zeros, um, the prob probability that it may not be prime is one over two, two, five, six. Uh, we can we can ignore the fact that we know it's not prime because it's zero. But the probability that it may not be prime is one over two five six. Um, in the same way that if the uh, string itself is all ones, uh, i.e., it's a, a, a Mosen number, the probability of it not being prime is uh, one over two. Uh, the probability that it may be prime is one over two five six. So there are some very, notice there are some, some interesting subtleties about the language I'm using here, and this is a work in progress. And so um, one of the things I need to do is to be very careful about uh, the language I use and be very exact in the formula, formulating, formulation of um, you know, the, the, what, what I'm doing. So this is a work in progress. So what I'm going to do now, which is different from what I've done, I've done before, is define uh, a binary variable called Q of S. Uh, and there is a, a Q for each of the derivatives of a string. Um, that, that should, sorry, that, that, sh this, that should say QK of S. Um, QK of S, QK of S. So QK of S is zero if the case derivative of S S is zero or one, one otherwise, with the exception that 
if the string itself is all ones, uh, QK of S is also zero. So I apologize for that slight error there in the subscript. So the probability that the string may not be prime is the sum from zero to the length of the string um, in bits minus one of QK of S uh, divided by, in this case, it would be uh, an eight bit case, it'd be 256. Um, so uh, N, which is two, N, which is four, two N is eight. So two to the power of eight is 256. So the probability that S may not be prime is, is the sum over the, uh, uh, of each, over each of the derivatives of the value of uh, k. And so the interesting little piece of notation I've got it is that uh, the problem, so this entity here, I call p not prime of s. So this is the probability that s may not be prime. And so in the 8-bit case, um, the uh, mean, mean s, uh, there's a couple of errors, there's probably a couple of errors on this slide as well, uh, but uh, uh, p, p not prime s ranges from 0 to 1, and its mean value is 0 0.5. So as we compute the individual individual qks, uh, i whether or not the um, qk is 0 or 1, this gets us our value between zero and one, which tells us uh, the likelihood that the uh, number may or may not be prime based on the periodicity or absence of periodicity in its in its digits. Right. So, so every, every s, um, so every number has um, seven last derivatives, no matter how big it is. Um, so the um, that rule I've just elucidated in the the um, in the eight bit strings that applies to all string all strings because every every number can be differentiated down to uh, uh, an eight bit string and the properties that we uh, observe in the eight bit string of every number uh, apply to the number uh, so the um, in, in, in this work, there's, uh, we can use a lot of induction, uh, so to deduce the behavior of very large numbers from uh, uh, a very small eight-bit number. Uh, and again, um, so the probability is each bit being one is 0 0.5. So in, in, in the traditional uh, work, a pi of s um, is the number of primes less than s. Uh, where the numbers are, are expressed in their natural ordering. Uh, and so uh, I write pi prime of s, which is the number of primes less than s uh, in, the, in the p not prime s ordering. So we can sort the entire number line um, from zero to infinity into a different order and the order that we sort the natural numbers into is the order in which they may or may not be prime based upon the periodicity observed in the binary derivatives. And so I've, I've, there are, I've got a couple of entries now on the uh, online encyclopedia, encyclopedia of um, integer sequences. Uh, most famous one, I suppose, is, is uh, A000040, which is the uh, sequence of prime numbers. And so uh, the, 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 so the, the pi of s, which is the number of primes less than or equal to s, uh, you can see runs 0, 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, because if we if the number of primes less than zero is zero, number of primes less than or equal to one is zero, number of primes less than or equal to two is one because two is prime, number of primes less than or equal to three is two because two and three are prime and, and so on. And this this sequence uh, is is logarithmic, uh, and that, that was shown um, uh, by Hadamard and others. Um, 
over 100 years ago. So the sequence of, that I have, I've got two, two sequences up there. Uh, so the one that relates to I prime of S is the number of primes less than S uh, where the numbers are expressed in the pi prime of S order. So the first eight digits in pi prime of S order, 0, 5, 3, 6, 1, 2, 7, 4. So the number of primes less than five in this ordering is one. Number of primes less than three is two. Number of primes less than six is two. Number of primes less than one is two, and so on. Um, takes a bit of time to get your head around it. But this sequence, zero, one, two, two, three, three, four, 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 uh, is quadratic. And of course, note, notice that the last entry in this sequence is four. And if we go back, uh, the last entrance in, in this sequence is four, as it, as it must be, because we're dealing with the first eight entries. And no matter what order we put them in, they must all have the same number of prime, or, prime numbers, because the number, because the, there's the same sequence, but in, just in a different order. And it, it, Hadamard showed the sequence was logarithmic, and I'll show, I've shown and will prove and can prove that uh, this sequence is uh, quadratic. And the important point being that the uh, as s goes from zero to infinity, the two endpoints of these sequences match up because the first entry is always zero, and the last entry is always um, s the number of um, numbers that are counting the number of primes less than. So the probability of s may not be prime, p, p, p not prime of s um, is quadratic. Uh, and so here, here we can see uh, ostensibly for the first uh, two to the eight numbers, first two fifty six numbers, uh, we can see the step change as we get the primes arriving in this new ordering and here's the quadratic curve that fits them uh, so every, every, everything we know about something being prime um, is based on a proven link a, a proven concept about the fact that primes in a periodic cannot be um, uh, there's a proven result that shows that a number that is periodic cannot be prime and that's expressed as a proof and then we've got two associated rules, uh, which are also proofs. First rule show, uh, tells us about uh, the binary derivative and detecting periodicity. And the second rule tells us about the probability of being a uh, prime based on the uh, properties of the uh, binary derivative. And so this gives us this, uh, this, this curve, which is quadratic, um, uh, where it ties up exactly uh, with uh, the natural curve and so we can compute the error uh, between the, the error between this curve here and the step function. Uh, we can compute the error. Uh, I'm not skilled enough to compute the error exactly, um, but I, I know that from the central limit, limit theorem, uh, the, the, the p not prime. Uh, uh, is Gaussian due to the central li limit theorem. I've spent many decades in business uh, adding up um, millions of um, binary variables that are either zero or one, and where the probability of zero being 0 0.5 and one being 0 0.5, uh, I know that the outcome is a, a, be a beautiful, a beautiful little uh, normal normal curve due to the central limit theorem uh, with a mean of zero and uh, a calcul calculable uh, variance. So the error in E prime, as I call it, in P not prime uh, is Gaussian. So uh, e, e, e prime is the difference between um, P not prime of S and the actual P, uh, P prime S uh, divided by 
um, 256 in the 8 bit case. So, as the string tends to infinity, the error and peanut prime tends to zero. Um, so we've got uh, the, the, the number of derivatives um, uh, is um, n, n squared divided by two, and um, the length of the um, so as as s tends to infinity, the error uh, must uh, go to uh, uh, go to zero in the limit. No, I should probably uh, I should be able to express that more exactly in a, in, in a, in a, in, on a future date. So, so here's the uh, quadratic p not prime curve. Uh, here's the logarithmic i curve. So, num number of primes less than s, and they 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 all, they all tie for all all s they tie together at the uh, beginning at the end, and. So the errors in the so the error e prime is is Gaussian, and that must in limit exactly match uh, the error in the natural logarithm or curve versus e versus pi of s. And the reason for uh, so e prime tends to zero as, as s tends to infinity. And the reason for this is because the logarithmic curve and the quadratic curve uh, are, are all cent are both central measures. Um, so I've, I've just shown that the quadratic is uh, Gaussian mean zero. Um, it's been shown long ago that the error in the logarithmic, logarithmic curve uh, is zero as s tends to infinity. And it's also been shown that the um, number of times that the error, uh, that the error becomes positive or, or negative, it, 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 trans, it transits the logarithmic curve infinitely many times um, after a number called Stokes number, which is the some large number that uh, is the first time that the uh, uh, error in the log curve switches sign. But so, so um, Basically, because 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 the numbers, because the errors are the same errors, but in a different order, um, the uh, the the er the errors in uh, the quadratic curve and the logarithmic curve uh, coincide, and I, I've shown that empirically. So the ver uh, so the variance um, between the Number of primes less than s uh, minus what's known as Lies, which is the uh, uh, number of primes in the logarithmic approximation as uh, tends to zero as s tends to infinity. Um, so, what what that means uh, is that the logarithmic using log, log, log x as an approximation, or yeah, sorry, using Li x, using Li s as an approximation. Uh, yeah, you, Li s is not merely an approximation to the number of, of primes less than s. Li s in the limit is the number of primes less than s. Um, so um, the, the logarithm is essentially equal, the natural logarithm um, in continuous theory of anything is the same as the um, number of primes less than s in any domain. So von Koch showed that um, if the Riemann hypothesis was, was obtained by proving that the difference between um, i of x and li of x is of the order of root x log x. Uh, so I've, I've shown, or will show, Rigor rigorously that uh, uh, the difference between pi x and li x, um, or at least the variance of the difference is, is nil. Um, so I'm not really showing that the uh, Riemann hypothesis is, is true. I'm showing uh, another result, which is even more profound, uh, which is the equivalence between pi of x and uh, li of x. So the um, you know, whenever we observe the, the natural logarithm, 
uh, we are observing exactly the number of primes. And so you have an in integration between uh, the, the, the discrete and the continuous in the limit. So um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Thank you very much. Can you de-screen yourself for a moment in case uh, other people want to see you and talk? Oh, de-screen myself. But, um... Maybe um, Barbara can do that. I'm not so sure. Well, anyway, uh, okay. people who want to ask questions, go ahead. Uh... Just look for a quick screen okay. share. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Those who wish to ask questions, please raise their hands. Well, people are thinking, I have a very general question. Uh, why is why is uh, primes seem to be so important that we should understand them at this level of thinking? It's but, not just a stamp collecting thing. There must be some uh, something fundamentally interesting here. It's for it's from this. If you're going to build an if you're going to build a build a universe with. Uh, 1024-bit uh, integers as your uh, coordinate coordinate system. Um, it'd be nice to know that um, if you made the hard bits prime and everything else not prime, that at least you'd know how many hard bits there were. Well, I'm into building universes or at least trying to understand them. Uh, anybody else got a more intelligent question? Well, I like your question. Uh, if if you had restricted your attention to the new, the the universe of natural numbers, then the primes appear as uh, atomic in a certain sense, right? They don't they don't decompose multiplicatively into anything but themselves. So so they're obviously important from the math to the mathematical eye. The question you're asking is. Are they fundamentally important in the physical universe? Thank you for making my question much more intelligent, Lou. How oh. about answering that one, then, Greville? Oh, yeah, that, that, that's that, that's the uh, that's the question very articulately articulately put, um, and that's a philosophical question as well. Um, but you know, if 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 the yeah, since the prime since the primes are exactly continuous in the limit, that means that whenever we and because of the Gaussian, that means that whenever we want to prime, th there is always a prime number within a well-defined distance, and that distance is normal. Uh, so mm -hmm. we can always be you can always rely upon finding a prime uh, wh where you need one. And that's important in you know, yeah, cryptography and all sorts of other applications. Um, but if you're uh, trying to find a, a coordinate system that works in an engineering sense for how how, how the world works, then that's that's important too. You know, and I don't I don't know enough about physics to uh, to be able to you know, articulate that. But uh, uh, well, there there are other relationships, right, that people are wondering about. For example. You start by saying, what's the distribution of the primes? Uh, and uh, by a train of thought, you end up with, what are the zeros of the Riemann zeta function? And if you knew the zeros, you would know the distribution of the primes in a very precise way. But what people discovered was that the zeros of the zeta function seem to be distributed uh, like the eigenvalues of a random Hermitian matrix. And so it's conceivable that there is physics of a quantum physics in back of, of the primes through those formulations. But this is this is through a graph through a glass darkly. Yeah. And in, and investigated by a whole lot of 
people who are interested in the physics of that, like Michael Berry. Would, so that's one line uh, in relation to the primes in physics. You mentioned uh, several publications. Uh, are publications, you know, the density of publications on such subjects uh, increasing? In other words, is there a, a sort of growth of interest in these things? Well, the, the, the whole subject of primes is of uh, um, uh, uh, you know, widespread interest. You know, thousands of publications. Um, one, one thing I would mention about this particular work is that uh, um, the defence establishments are aware of this work, and there's a patent around that uses mm -hmm. this work to improve. It, 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 it's a patent involved in the design of a integrated circuit chip for generating high quality random numbers. Uh, that, uses, that uses this work. Um, and so that is indicative of the importance because um, if, we, if we can generate prime numbers faster and of higher quality than anyone else can, then we can build, build stronger cryptographic systems. Um, and remember the reverse problem is, I give you a number, can you factor it? I, I, and, I, I, uh, I, and this, <laughs> This problem is very, very hard using classical mathematics, but, but Shord found a, a very beautiful algorithm using quantum computers, if there were one, uh, yeah. uh, that will factor numbers quickly. And this, if, if we ever get quantum computers uh, in a real sense, uh, this will make a big difference in terms of cryptography and, and security. Uh, but, it, but it also, his algorithm, shows that finding primes when you look at it through the lens of a quantum physicist is a different story. It has to do with Fourier transform and then finding frequencies and periodicities. So um, well, I think of these things as hints about what might be fundamental about primes in physics. But, yeah, so this, 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 this work, this work is, is deeply based on periodicity in all bases. And uh, of course, that in, uh, begs the question of the relationship between this work and, and the Fourier transform. Um, uh, we, I mean, that's not, it's not within my lot to pursue that line of inquiry, but I know that would be a particular, any results in there would be of particular importance. Yeah. If you look at if you Sorry. look at the first, if you look at the first few primes, they are important, aren't they? Because you have three, and then you have, uh, and you have seven, which is related to three, and then eleven. You have eleven-dimensional string theories. It's, uh, ah, it's, it's kind yeah. of curious that a lot of these important numbers come up, but uh, that's not a physics argument. That's just. A... <laughs> well, yeah, is it? Uh, I noticed in um, a couple of presentations er earlier, um, you, you got uh, you, know, you got two, you got two cubed, you got three cubed. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the number of yeah, you you, you, you do wonder if the uh, number of dimensions is uh, um, got a another reason behind it. Uh, Ooh, that would be a I, primal reason. Yeah, sorry. Can I point out that Nicola and James are hanging on for eternity already? They are trying oh, to ask questions. Go, go ahead, James. Well, I was, uh, Nicola I, was first. Thank you, Bob. Oh, thank you. So, someone's noticed the, the formality, the formalism of, of Zoom presentations. Um, but I mean, mine is a really, it's very general. I, I, I'm just thinking, it just started me thinking very speculatively. In, in, yes, in, I mean, in terms of the, uh, our reality and yeah, the the relationship between mathematics and physics, and if to what extent, uh, yeah, yeah, to, I mean, yes, to what extent we're living in the matrix, really, I suppose, might, might be one way of putting it. Um, it's a great way of putting it to the masses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's, I heard that I was in a, a Zoom conference with a, with some people the other day. There was a guy who, who was, um, yeah, some kind of cryptographic physicist, and he uh, he was talking about 
Schrodinger equation and talking about the fact that it's been looked at quantizing energy and that if we were thinking about quantizing time, which is interesting in terms of what you're talking about, <laughs> um, you know, then it is, you know, you can, you can look at this, you know, the matrix that, that what we're, you know, what we experience is the matrix. So obviously from my point of view, as a, as a deeply spiritual person, then there is, it's, you know, obviously, uh, I, I would take the other tablet or, or, or hope that I've already taken the other tablet and, uh -huh. um, and, and have a connection outside of the matrix, which I believe well, we all have the possibility. What do you really mean when you use the metaphor of the matrix? Do you mean that there is a, that there is a, uh, a machine world which is programming us into what we see? Um, or do you mean that we you, we could recognize the extent to which the worlds that we do see are constructed worlds by us. Uh, well, I yeah, I mean, my tendency again as a as a spiritual you know as a as a spiritual person who believes that God is love uh, is the latter that, that and and this you know this goes along with then obviously the uh, yeah the divine comedy so 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 we're we're in purgatory here because we've made it purgatory um and we have the possibility of creating heaven on earth right so that 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 pretty sense a different <laughs> <laughs> presents quite a different possibility than the matrix where where the matrix presents a, a peculiar paradox, which yeah. you might would not want to take on, of a of a machine world, which produces a, a sentient world, which goes into uh, antagonism with the machine world, and the question of the nature of machine and the nature of sentience. But um, but if we look at our worlds as worlds that we have. Uh, come to construct through our evolution it's an easier metaphor to work with i think yeah 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 i mean uh, yeah i think the um you know that that we are looking at the, the the dangers of uh attempts to create the uh, a machine world um for us all to live in with you know you know that all you know kind of you know locked down total surveillance you know all yeah. zoomed and live like that you know that there is yeah. that but, um, you, you don't need the machine, you just need to remember all the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I think James Lindsay has got his uh, hand up, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to say I was astounded and intrigued. It seems like you're finding order in primes. Uh, that's, that's mind boggling. So I have a question, it may be a little too difficult to ask at this time. But is it possible that the order in the primes would make it more difficult to use prime numbers for encryption in the future? That, that uh, you know, you could have, you could find order that makes it difficult to use factoring primes for encryption. Uh, no, because the, um, uh, if, you, the, the, if you look at the, the, the mathematics behind what I've just done, uh, the, work, the work of, um, um, Davis et al, who show that the uh, probability of a, a, a bit uh, of a derivative being zero or one is 0 0.5. They do, they, do, they do it algebraically, uh, but the other way of doing it is, it, it is doing it inductively. Um, so that uh, uh, the implication is that uh, the bits of a derivative uh, are, are Gaussian and that means that um, you have to use a process uh, which occurs in a stated order to find the bits of each derivative. And once you find the, found the result of what the status of each derivative is, you then know the probability whether something is or may be prime or may not be prime. And so what I've done is to not enumerate the order in the primes. I've, I've, I've quantified the, the, the nature of the disorder. So, if you, if you think of all number, think you think of a, think of a thousand bit number. Now, think of all th all one thousand bit numbers. 
now think of all the derivatives of all the 1000 bit numbers and the, 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 what I've just done, those rules apply to all those numbers. So that there's a there's a deep, much deeper connection between every number and every no other number. So for example, take the simple case of the eight bit numbers. Um, every eight bit number has seven derivatives. Uh, I've done everything in binary, but I could enumerate a table that showed what the deanery values of, of each of the seven derivatives of each number. And so for the first, so for the first 256 numbers, we'd know what the connection matrix was, right? And so because every number can now differentiate down to an 8-bit number, what I'd then have in, in this table would be a, a statement of connection between every number and every other number in a way that's never been done before. And, it's, and, and in a way that's important to determining the primality of a number. I'm going to be busy doing this for quite a while. <laughs> John Williamson, I think you're trying to have another question, right? Um, yeah, um, I, I was just wondering, um, has anyone looked at, I'm interested in inverse stuff at the moment, what about inverse primes? And that's an interesting distribution as well, going down to zero. What, what do you mean by an inverse prime? Um, one over three, one over seven, one over 11. That, that distribution goes goes from one down. There's a, fam oh, there's a famous. Oh, I uh, see. There's, yeah. a, there's a very famous. Isn't there a very a very little, little know this, but there's a very a, a very famous and obvious sequence that's sim simply the uh, um, sum of the inverse primes. Isn't that the re the Riemann zeta function? You're right, but if you just take the sum of the inverses of the primes with no exponents on them, that diverges. Yeah. That was one of the first results or okay. they prove that right yeah, just like what well, the sum of one over n diverges but the sum of one over prime also diverges uh, yeah uh, 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 another quick comment on uh, what nicola was talking about about quantized time you know, to, it's more interesting i think if you look at inverse time and you look at frequency because frequency is quantized that, that's what, one of the quantum conditions is that it's uh, e is h nu so uh, so, um, so, so, so once again, but that's nothing to do with primes, of course. But uh, nonetheless, it, interesting in the nature of space and time that that's that, that that the quantization comes in the inverse, not in the not in the number, which seems to be extensive and continuous. At least some people view it as uh, as such, although it may, of course, not be. It may be discrete as well at some level. So, but the quantization appears in the inverse. Uh, also, for momentum, the momentum appears in the inverse spatial direction, not in the spatial direction. So um, anyway, just a thought. Just to... I, I have a comment which is aimed at Nicola before she goes to sleep. Are you <laughs> awake there, Nicola? <laughs> um, Peter Rowland's opened the gate to non-material things, which I would guess includes spirituality, in his uh, reality too. And Philip and I briefly had an interchange on uh, Bohm. Now, Bohm believes the entire, if you like, um, existence of knowledge or information, you can choose the exact word, uh, is recorded in what he calls the hollow movement. And the people who've discussed this, you know, Laszlo and the Akashic Records and so on, they have argued that there is a scheme in which nothing ever has to be duplicated. Everything is totally original. And this maybe answers uh, Lou's point that there may be some, uh, shall we say, way of looking at the structure reality and maybe uh, even some special position in this hollow movement uh, or Akashic record for prime numbers. Thank you very much, Grenville, for uh, taking us in this direction. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. Well, I think, I, yeah. Go on. Um, cash it records time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So what you were saying, Lou, about, yeah, the, this thing about what worlds we're creating, I think also it is something that has started, you know, that 
has been coming up in Francois Chatelain's work. Again, this looking at a different kind of uh, the possibilities of mathematics with a diff different kinds of uncertainty built in. Uh, you know, these Dixon algebras, which is what, you know, one of the things that John Ampson has now been looking at. Uh, so going on from non-commutativity and, you know, non-associativity uh, and actually talking about the possibility of thinking about these strange algebras that don't, you know, that are not so manageable as pointing towards human creativity. And uh, I think, this is, I've, I've just got, because you know what you were saying as well, uh, Grenville, about how you listen to Lou and things come in through osmosis. Well, I have the same thing about the whole of that. Do you know what I mean? So I listen to James and I, I listen to Pish, I think. And, and something is happening because it's, it, it is this, the complexity. I mean, yeah, because I, coming from like a totally different place, really, in a way, yeah, starting from a different place. Because I come, I, you know, I mean, I've, I've said for years that basically if you, to, to be signed, the, the, you know, the problem of materialism is, is not materialism per se. The problem is that it's, it's thought of as fact. That's the problem. And as such, it's an ideology because to be scientific, you would say, well, you know, maybe matter and, and energy come first or maybe consciousness comes first or maybe they co-arise. And, uh, but I mean, basically I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with the, the, the latter two, I, I, you know, um, so, but, so for me, well, I, as you know, I, I see, so all the physics stuff really for me is, is mathematics, because it's all, it's all ideas and ideas are living beings. And, and so that we, we have this, I mean, Ampa just has this huge richness of, uh, of, of ideas that, um, I'm just very <laughs> grateful for. Don't forget that the, um, work I've just done, um, depends on the simplest of the discriminations, it's a discrimination of zero and one. So the, 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 I've, got, I've gone from you know, the simplest discrimination to the, the largest prime in uh, less than six moves. Nick, checkmate. <laughs> Lou wants to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I wanted to speak to that. There's this, uh, one often finds oneself saying, well, it, it appears that it's all mathematics in speaking of physics and mathematics and natural science, but it, but, but I think it helps to make another discrimination there uh, of percept and concept, because in, in physics, you are always going back and forth across the boundary between percept and concept. A concept is not, a concept is something which, if you take it all by itself, appears to be not of the world at all. And percept taken all by itself appears to be entirely of the world, but neither of them occur individually, they occur together. Yeah. And, and so sensitive to that, we end up in the domains of feeling and in and places where one cannot articulate either concept or percept quite so easily. Yeah. And we need to understand what what kind of boundary crossing we are doing yeah. when we do natural science. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think it's it's sort of got there are two ways you can see it that you can see that boundary crossing as if there's a material world you're trying to understand, or you can see the unity of of mathematics, like in Peter's work or Lou's work. As, as something that um, applies before matter appears, or matter appears in that unity, realizing itself at different levels in different beings, in different things happening. And so that, th that idea that, th that there's a unity that kind of fills itself out in many different ways, it is kind of allowing that creativity and that um you know that expressiveness of the precept and life alongside the concepts and mm. that the concept 
so just pursuing that point, uh, so imagine a thousand bit number that specifies some piece of reality. And uh, by one exclusive or it's related to a, another number that's almost of a thousand bits uh, long, which specifies some other part of reality. And so by a simple single discrimination, you've got two parts of the universe connected directly to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John Williamson, you got a hand up. Yeah, I've, I've just worked out how to do that, so I'm really enjoying playing with it. Um, yeah, yeah. The um, mathematics. This is an inter very interesting discussion about the, the relationship between mathematics and, and reality. But I think that the, 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 what's happening is math is a language. One's taking one's taking a conceptual framework which one puts on, which one learns, which one discovers, also partly in talking to different people. But that changes the perception, it changes the relationship that one has with, with reality uh, completely. It allows one to see it in a different way. It allows one to, in many cases, think things which otherwise couldn't be thought about at all. That conceptual framework is quite different. And one can take those conceptual frameworks and play with them and use different ones. And sometimes the things that one thinks about are contradictory in one compared to another. An example for me is going from complex numbers, which I find extremely limiting, to quaternions, which I find much more fun and get a lot more and get a lot more out of, and going to multiple composite spaces, which uh, which um, uh, at the moment I'm playing with multiple 3D spaces, which is a completely different way of looking at things and allows one to come in from a different direction. I don't think one's better than another necessarily, but it does completely change the way that one thinks and the way that one perceives and the way that one understands putting on these different uh, these different pieces of software flexibility yeah, is really important you know yeah the, it, yeah the flexibility of moving from one to another i'm looking forward to the sam's presentation because i think this this would be this could be very very helpful if flexibility of visualization of more dimensions sorry I, I've, I've Barbara, yeah. do you wish to say anything at this point about the time or anything? Well, I mean, people have very good discussions, so I'm just sitting quietly and and, and waiting. It's uh, okay. uh, I, I was actually, uh, I would like to to say something about reality, but not now. It's, it's much more for the general discussion. It's... Uh, um, Opera, may I may I go back to something we talked about before? Because I've just it's something that um, I've not looked at for a long time. It's to do with James's yeah. talk earlier, and to do with the with the, uh, with the electromagnetic coupling to different systems. Can I just because it's been so long since I looked at these things that I've forgotten sure. details. Is it okay to go back? Yep. Go ahead. Please. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I went back to have a look at um, some of those data and. Um, and I don't think you're right, James, in terms of the thing going up by factors of one third and, 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 and two thirds. In fact, if you look at the data, what happens is you hit a bunch of resonances. And when you cross the charm threshold, for example, you'd expect a jump of, uh, you'd expect a jump of uh, one and a third as opposed to two, which you get when you cross, the, uh, when you cross uh, one of the uh, neon town or town thresholds. What you actually get is something which is bigger you mean, than that. You mean four and nine? You mean four ninths, but I understand four yeah. four ninths. Yeah, yeah, no, because there's two. It's the square, right? It's the square. Yeah, because you have, yeah, you have lots. You have lots. Of, well, the square of the charge is the coupling. Is the coupling, but, uh, right. but what you're doing is you're having a look at a charge. But what you see is something that looks like an integral charge. In fact, it looks more than integral. So the jump is actually bigger than integral at that at that threshold. It's more than one. So um, which is kind of a mystery. But also, if you look at the whole thing, what it does is it's not flat and then has a jump and then goes flat. It has all sorts of structure on it. And whenever you cross any of the, any of the masses, and these things are much narrower than you'd expect them to be, for example, well, the first that you come up to things like the, 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 the J-Psi particle, for example, has an enormous peak on it on resonance. So if you, if, you, if you tune to that precise, if you tune to that precise energy, then it goes up to, I don't know how big it is, it's off scale on the thing, a thousand. So, so, so it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not in the integral ranges. And then, if you look above that, then you'll see there's all sorts of structure on that as well, with little jumps all over the place for particles. And, and, and the reason for these extra numbers is because one opens new channels, one opens hadron channels, and so forth that one can also couple to. 
but it's not it's not as simple at all as just be i think um you might have remembered something from a theoretical view of what those things do which is mm -hmm. they should have but uh, but have a look at the data and it's it's not um it's not as simple as simple jumps and it doesn't no, look you're, talk, you're talking about the ratio of uh total cross section yes to yes. Uh, e plus e minus yeah. e plus e minus yeah r is a function not, of e plus e minus wow, energy i, yeah, I remember it being but I agree, there's structure, especially even up down, Loads of course, of because yeah. there's the up and then there's the down. But yeah, when it right. integrates and smooths out, it is four ninths plus one ninth. Yeah, for well, a little well, while until you right, the next threshold. Yeah, but it is, it, it, it's certainly not simple and it wasn't clear. It was uh, perhaps a bit of a mystery in the beginning for these things, which is why people went into deep elastic lepton scattering and started having, trying, trying to look at the bound corks to have a look at those. But that failed as well because what happened is as you looked more and more detail then what one found is that the x for those scattering so the percentage of the the fraction of the momentum of the proton carried by the struck quark the distribution for that at low energy scattering looks as though you're sitting quite high x's so you're hitting things that look as though they might be a valence quark at an x of a third or an x of a sixth because the Kalan gross sum gives you something which is only half of it you only see half of it appears to be uncharged entirely which is also interesting so so if you look at the charge bits it's only half of what's sitting inside the hadron um uh, john could we uh encourage you to include yeah. these comments in the speech you're going to give later this week <laughs> like that's about something completely different sorry no i know yeah. i know that what i'm what i'm trying to say is you and uh mr linda's a uh you know you've dragged us back to numerology and 